Hey, this is Mike from the One Stop Co-op Shop, diving into the war game genre again. This time we're looking at Pavlov's House from Dan Versen Games, designed by David Thompson. Quick disclaimer that the designer, David, did send me this copy. And another disclaimer, I recorded a full playthrough of this about uh, two or three weeks ago. It was a great game, super intense, came right down to the wire. I barely lost in the end. And then I proceeded to accidentally erase all of my footage. Now luckily, I really like the game, or you would never be seeing this video because I would just give up in frustration. But with that context in mind, I hope you'll understand that I'm not going to show an entire full playthrough of the game, which would probably be a little bit over an hour. Instead, I'm going to go through maybe one or two waves, talk through the basics of play, and give you a feel for how it goes, and hopefully that and my review will be enough to tell you whether you might be interested in this one. So Pavlov's house is set during the Battle of Stalingrad, and you are on the Russian side of things. And it's an interesting design in that it mixes squad-based tactics and operational control. Over here on this side is one half of the game where you're controlling the entire Russian army in Stalingrad and trying to defend yourself while also getting supplies to your soldiers. The middle models the German army advancing on your positions and trying to destroy you. And the left part of the board is where the game actually gets its name, Pavlov's House. It was a strong point, basically an apartment complex that uh, was seen as at least a moral victory, if not an instrumental foothold in Stalingrad. So let's jump into how the game set up, the basics of play, and then I'll show you some turns. So first you're gonna set up the opposition, the Wehrmacht card, the German attack cards. And each of these cards has a number one through five in its bottom right corner. What you're gonna do is you're gonna take each set of numbers separately and shuffle them. So all the four shuffle together, all of the three shuffle together. Separately, you're going to shuffle these six resupply cards, and you'll take those resupply cards and put them on top of your number two, your number three, and your number four pile. So all three of the middle decks will have resupply cards on top. Then you stack the piles in numerical order, the ones on top, the fives on the bottom. So you're going to get your toughest cards, all your tanks and terrible things uh, coming in later in the invasion. And I should note, there's a single card that's a rifleman in the one deck that's labeled as competitive. Uh, take this out if you're playing the game solo or co-op, which is the only way I've played it. I'm not going to recommend it for competitive play, but maybe it's great. Next, you need to decide if you're going to use the tactics cards that really vary up what the Germans will do. I recommend them, but not for your first game, but they do give some nice variety and extra challenge to the German opposition. And these cards are very similar to the previous cards. They have one through four in the bottom. They're also color-coded. And you're going to shuffle each pile separately, take out three of the ones and two of each of the other colors, and then stack them, fours on the bottom, up to ones on top. Next, you can choose whether to use the operational support cards or not. Unlike the tactics cards, they don't make the game more difficult. They just give you an extra way to earn more victory points at the cost of losing some resources your units might need. So we're not going to use that in this playthrough, but they are there as an additional option. Now we're going to set up our operational Soviet cards, and this operation is much quicker. You're going to take all of the regular cards, plus three of the seven Fog of War cards, shuffle them all together, and you're good to go. But you should keep those other four Fog of War cards handy, because they can get added to your deck later, depending on how the bombers hit you. Now with all your decks set up, you want to organize your tokens. And you've got kind of three main categories here. You've got the German units here. I usually do one row of infantry and one row of armor. You have your operational tokens. I put the ones that can be sent to Pavlov's house at the top and the ones that actually go on the operational board on the bottom. And then finally, you've got the Russian units you can call upon throughout the game. I like to organize them from cheapest to most expensive. You'll see they have a number of dots in the bottom right from one to six showing their cost to reinforce with them. And almost done, to prep the actual house, you're going to take the four units with a little white square in their bottom right instead of a cost. Those are the ones who actually took the house historically, including Pavlov, and they're going to go in the reserves. You're going to put two food and ten suppression tokens in the supply. And I like to have my three starred action tokens here, as well as my command tokens. There is a fourth action token, but you don't get that unless you get all three leaders in at one time, so don't worry about that for the start. And last step, the defenses of the house on all three sides start super strong. So you're going to put these little shield tokens on each of the sixes, and you're good to go. With setup out of the way, let's go through the basics of play, starting with the operational turns. 
And I do want to note quickly, although this game is primarily a solo game, you can play co-op where one of you handles this entire side of the board and the other person handles the actual Pavlov's house. So you can kind of uh, support each other in those roles. But how the operational turn works is you'll draw four of the operational cards and each of them will have one of two actions you can resolve. Out of these four cards, you can play up to three of them, unless you start your turn with all four of these wire tokens out on their spaces, in which case you can play all four cards. But if you draw a Fog of War card, that's basically a dead card in your hand. You'll see the main effects of each of these cards as I go through my turns, but let me go over some of the key basics. In general, when you play a card matching one of these spots, you'll either remove a disrupted token that's been placed on that spot by a bomber, or you'll place the matching token on the board, which will give you some kind of benefit. The anti-aircraft will let you try to shoot down the bombers. The artillery lets you potentially call in artillery strikes on the German position. The wire tokens, as I already noted, if you can get all four of them, will allow you to do more cards each turn. And this one here, the staging area and the flotilla are pretty important. If you use one of the command post cards, you can take some of the resources the house might need, like food to feed its soldiers, sappers to repair the walls, more ammo or medicine, and you can put five of those tokens in any distribution in the staging area with that command post card. Then the flotilla cards, which were a mix of like ferries and boats that would bring things across the Volga, one of them will move three of the items onto the individual spaces here, and another one of those cards will move them into your supplies in the actual house. And similarly, if you play one of these 13th Guard Rifle Division Command postcards, you get to call in up to six points worth of reinforcements, again, with each uh, person showing how much they cost out of those six. So like I mentioned earlier, yes, this is kind of its own thing, and if you neglect this too much and let your command post get blown up twice, you lose the game. But it's also directly tied to keeping the defenders in the house alive. You're sending them reinforcements. You're sending them supplies they desperately need, giving them artillery fire. Next, we go into the Wehrmacht phase, where we see what the Germans are doing. If you're playing with the optional tactics cards, you flip the top card of the deck over, and it'll give a bonus to units for this entire turn. Like they might hit the house harder, they might reinforce more, those kind of things. Then you draw three cards from the top of the deck, resolving them one at a time. Again, you'll see the specifics of what can happen when I actually do the playthrough, but in basic terms, many of them will spawn infantry and armor on these tracks, rolling a d6 to see where they go. And if the spawn space is already filled, they'll push everybody in. And if this pushes a unit all the way into the house, you immediately lose. Other common effects are bombers, which will hit your stuff over here. They roll 3d6 to see where they strike. And generally speaking, if one of your good tokens is there, they remove it. If it's not there, they place a disrupted token. And if they hit a place that's already disrupted, they count up towards destroying your HQ. So if 10 is already filled and they roll a 10, they'll place it on the 11 instead. And finally, you'll have effects that attack the house directly. And while the rules for these vary, the way it's resolved is pretty consistent. Whatever enemy is attacking will target one of the three walls and they'll roll a certain number of dice, and if at least one of those dice equals or exceeds the defense value of the wall, they all start at six, then you're gonna tick the wall down one, or you'll do whatever the effect says, like uh, hurting or killing or suppressing the defenders inside the house. And finally, if one of those resupply cards that we seated in the deck comes up, you need to be able to eat one food for every five defenders you have in the house. Everyone over that dies immediately, so don't be without enough food. Finally, getting to the tactical phase, you begin the turn with three free moves. And for one move, you can take a unit from anywhere on the board and move them to any other open spot on the board. Or you can even move them to an occupied spot. And if you do that, you get a free replacement move to place this guy somewhere else. A key point though, these guys can be exhausted from having taken an action a turn before or they can be disrupted from getting hit by suppressing fire. And if either of those is the case, they can't move and you can't move someone in to take their place. And the key concept of movement is people in the reserves are safe, but they can't do much of anything. But people in the other spaces have line of sight and can be attacked by people in the matching color. So over here in these spots, we can shoot at the purple guys. Over here, we can shoot at green. Over here, we can shoot at red. And you'll see there are two squares on the board that split the difference. You can both shoot and be shot at by green and red if you're here, and by red and purple if you're here. After using up to three free moves, you then get three actions. And the most basic action, if I have line of sight to someone, is to shoot them. I roll as many dice as the value on the left, and if at least one of them equals or exceeds their defense, kind of like when they shoot at us, that person is discarded. 
I can also, if I have a value on the right, which is a suppression value, use suppression tokens that I've gotten either from the start of the game here or from bringing ammo over from the operational side of things. And that lets somebody like this guy put as many tokens as indicated in the suppression box for their color. And these are kind of like saved shots. Whenever an infantry unit is spawned, not armor, and also the other attacks can't hit armor, you get to roll as many D6s as you discard and have a chance of just destroying them immediately. Now pretty much all of these actions except for moving exhaust the person who does it. So another common action is to recover, which means you either flip your guy over or get rid of one of those disrupted tokens on them. And a key rule, you cannot take two actions with the same person in one turn. So I can't get exhausted and then recover. I have to wait until next turn and spend a whole action to recover. But a lot of units have these little letter guides here which show special powers. One of the key ones is C for command, which Pavlov and two other guys have. And if you exhaust one of them, you can put up to three command tokens on other people. These can only be used to recover, but they get you extra actions. Besides that, there is this radio space where as an action, you can get two points of reinforcements, kind of like a weaker version of the operational reinforcement. And a final really important thing before we play a few rounds, some units will have a G for machine gunner, an M for mortar, or an A for anti-armor like here. And that means that they can use a weapon, which are these different tokens, but you need to have two of those people to operate it. And this is the only case where more than one unit can share a space. And as an action, they can fire their weapon, which is usually way better than any normal weapon, like anti-armor is the only way to kill tanks besides artillery from the operational side of things. But it costs two of your three actions and it exhausts both your guys, so it's definitely expensive. So that's how to play Pavlov's House. I left out a few of the little edge cases, but let's get to playing and see how it all works. So for my first four cards, I've got reinforcements or anti-aircraft, uh, supplies or anti-aircraft, a fog of war I can't use, and once again, reinforcements or sappers. This is only usable if I already have a sapper token in the house, which I don't. So you usually discard at the end of the turn, but I'll just get rid of the fog of war now. And I think reinforcing, getting some supplies, getting some anti-aircraft is probably the best way to go. When you place anti-aircraft, you put one token on one of the four spots, and this says 267, so it's going to be up here. I'll go ahead and put it on uh, the 13th. For the command post, I get to get five supplies ready. We already have ammo and food, so I'm going to do mostly sappers and medicine, but I do have one more food there. And finally, six points of reinforcements. Now, I have a lot of options here, and it's not always obvious what you should do. I could get Chekhov, the famous sniper. He rolls four dice, so almost always will defeat any infantry unit he faces. Or I could spend the six to get two anti-armor guys and an anti-tank rifle and be ready for tanks, although they don't come until later. One that's fairly inexpensive is to get the two mortar team members and a mortar. Look, you can do six suppression. Ridiculous. Or similarly, I could get two machine gunners and a machine gun. It's not as good at suppression, but it can also do direct attacks. Or heck, I could get one of my two remaining commanders. If I get all three of them in the house at the same time, then I get four actions a turn and four moves instead of three. But for now, I think I'm going to do a little bit of everything. I'm going to get Hoholov, who is a pretty good sniper, not as good as Chekhov. Uh, the two mortar guys, but not have their mortar yet, and the machine gunner. I can get the mortar through the radio later on in the turn. And everyone just goes right into the reserves. They'll be able to move out later. All right, next let's see what our German enemies are doing. Because we're playing with tactics, we start with one of those, and it says add one to the defense of Junker Ju 87s Those are the bombers. So if we're lucky, none of these three cards will have them, although they are very common early in the battle. Now we resolve these one at a time. So first we roll to place a scout. They have one attack value. You got to roll a five or higher to hit them, and we know it's wave one. They're going in, ah, the less used track. Usually purple is the least uh, frequented. Uh, next is indeed a bomber. This is the number of bomber attacks and their defense, which remember is boosted to five this turn. I can discard as many anti-aircraft as I want to roll two dice for each token. And for each die that equals or exceeds their defense, I get rid of one of the bombers and suffer one less attack. But I'm not going to do that here since the odds are not in my favor. So let's just see where they hit us. German card for the turn is an artillery attack on the building. So you randomly determine which side of the building they're going to hit. You roll this many attack dice. And remember, you're trying to equal or exceed the defense with at least one die. So if at least one of them is a six, we will lose one strength from that side. So it'll go down to five. So they're hitting us on the green side. And they did not get a six. But just to show you what I mean, if they had gotten a six, this would now be down to a five value. It would be easier to hurt that side and the people inside of it. All right, we survived things decently well. We've got a scout over there. 
So let's move three of our units out and then take three actions. I don't want to move the mortar team or the machine gunner out yet because they don't have their weapons. But let's get Hohalov over here to try to take out that scout. Let's get one of my basic guys to the radio to call in the mortar. And let's get another one of my guys to either help Hohalov defeat the scout or to put a suppression down if he does. All right, first action, radio. We've got our mortar incoming. Goes right to the reserve for next turn. Second action, Hohalov will shoot at the scout. Needs at least one, five, or six. <laughs> Whoa, or both. Great. And this worked out well. Glushenko is now free to do a suppression action. I take one suppression token, and because he's in red and purple, I can put it in either. Red's way more likely for guys to come in on, so there we go. And that is it. I could mark them with these action tokens to remind me who did stuff this round, but it's pretty easy when it's this early. All right, the house did fairly well last turn, but operationally is not doing great. And yes, I got another fog of war. Now there is a special action with the signal battalion besides putting those tokens down to try to get four actions a turn. I can play this to remove a fog of war from my deck, so make my deck move a little bit more smoothly and draw a replacement card, but it still counts as one of my uh, three actions, so I only get to play two more cards. And then I've got more reinforcements. I don't know if I need that. I've already got eight guys in the house, so I can only add two more safely before they'll start starving. I got a lot of artillery, that'd be nice. And ooh, I got a Volga flotilla, so I could move three of these tokens to there, although they would be vulnerable to bombers hitting them before they actually get into the house with another card. So yeah, let's do that one first. And I want some sappers. They can repair my walls, very important. And uh, medicine, there we go. I'll use one of my artillery cards to remove that disrupted token. And let's see, more reinforcements or artillery. I don't have anyone with the F trait to call in artillery yet, so I guess the reinforcements make more sense. Although I could just put the token down there to protect from more bombers. And yeah, let's get a little wacky here. I'm going to spend three on an inspirational machine gunner, which means he'll make every other machine gunner in the building shoot better. And the most powerful machine gun in the game. That combo hopefully will be useful. Okay, our new tactic is coordination. Whenever you place an infantry counter, also place a rifleman rolling separately. This card takes effect even if the initial infantry counter is suppressed. Yikes. So we really don't want to draw infantry this turn. They could double up. Okay, card number one. Another attack the building. Wow, for five dice this time. Hitting us on green again. Really don't like that side. Ah, but no sixes. Beautiful. More bombers, of course. This time I will take my chances and roll two dice against them. And for each four or higher I get, I destroy one of them. Okay, so only one is getting through, and it's hitting me in nine. But that's already disrupted, so we're gonna count up to 10. Yeah, like I said, the bombers do not stop early in the battle. We have three hits incoming. Ooh, 13, nine again. Counts all the way up to 11. My middle is really filled out here. Finally, 10, counts up to 12. Now I'm a little lucky that I didn't hit any of my wire positions because when they're hit, you also add a new Fog of War card to your discard. And don't forget, if I get hit twice on 18 before I can repair it with one of those cards, I lose. Now we did get super lucky in that the tactic had no effect, no infantry came out, which also means we don't have much attacking to do. So I think what makes the most sense is use two of my move to send the mortar team up to the green red space, give me some flexibility in how I use it. And then also to send Pavlov out to where he can recover a bunch of guys. So my first action will be to command with Pavlov. And again, I can give recovery orders to up to three people. So we'll do all the guys who went last turn. And then for my second and third action, I'll use my mortar team. And yeah, I should probably get some more ammo. And they can split it since they're on red green. So let's do four total in red and three in green. I only have three of these left, but each ammo token I send over through the Volga will get me five more. Back to operations, let's play out a few more of these. Okay, good, I did get the flotilla to get my stuff delivered. Ooh, and I can put some more supplies there, including some ammo. Don't need the sapper yet, because no walls are hurt. I really need more reinforcements, I can barely fit them. Okay, so let's, uh, let's use this one to deliver. So all three of these go into the supplies of the house now. This will let me save a soldier who would die. And these, if I use the sapper action, will either be discarded to repair one of the walls by one point, or I can place it on one of these little end spots, and it gives me kind of a last-ditch attack when an enemy is uh, moving in and almost to the house. Hmm, I'd love to do more for the house, but we're okay. I think I need to really shore up things here. So let's play the Signal Battalion and put it on 14, the most likely to come to. Let's also play the Anti-Aircraft. It's 1,083 at the bottom, and uh, clear off the 9 space. Tactics for the Germans. Stuka Strike. Increase the number of bombers by 1. 
Thank God I already had so many of them. Hopefully I won't get any more. Ooh, and I just saw on the top of the deck is the resupply. You do get kind of a turn of warning. So I'm going to do these three cards, but the first card I resolve next turn will be eating. Okay, thank God things happened in this order, and we didn't flip the plane to the infantry, and I got a rifleman. Where is he going? He's going to the five red space. Now, I've previously placed four suppression tokens in the red suppression space. I can discard as many of these as I want, but I have to make the choice before I roll to give me that many attack dice to try to take out the rifleman straight up. I'm going to play the likely odds here and discard two. So if either of these is a four or more, there we go. So that guy never even shows up. My suppressive fire from my mortar has kept him back. Oh, but they didn't like that. They're hitting us with some artillery of their own. Five attack again. Where is it? Green again? Oh no, this time I'm purple. Wow, okay, still no six. Super lucky on those rolls. Oh no, they had one more bomber? Crud. I sadly have no anti-aircraft to hit him with, and he gets plus one, so there's three attacks. Oh, good thing I uncovered that. Okay, this takes away my token, so no fog of war added because it didn't get disrupted. And then last one, 11. Ah, counts up to 14 as well. So I do add a fog of war card to my discard pile for later. Bro, these bombers just will not leave me alone. All right, well, this is not great. I was dumb for sending over so much other supplies because I don't have very many actions to take and the best ones I could take would be to put suppression tokens down because there's no infantry on the board. In fact, in retrospect, I probably shouldn't have used a suppression on that guy. Could have just had Hohalov shoot him. I have it too late to worry about that. I'm about to eat and I have enough food for 10 people. Uh, weapons don't count, so I've got four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I could use the radio to bring in one more person. But before I do that, let's do my three movement. Uh, let's see, I could get my machine gunners out. And let's put them on a cross space as well. So we'll displace this guy. He can go anywhere he wants. Um, I guess more on red would be good. And my third move, uh, sure, there you go. For my three actions, I'll call in reinforcements. And again, I can only fit one more person. I'm going to get an armor attacking person because tanks should be coming in wave two. Second action, I'll unexhaust Pavlov. And third action, could have one of my 1-1 one, one guys suppress. Or I could unexhaust one of my two mortar team members, although Pavlov can do that for a single action next turn. So sure, let's suppress in uh, purple with this guy just to have a little bit of full coverage. All right, so there you go. That was a brief taste of the gameplay in Pavlov's house. You didn't see the insane stuff yet, like almost unkillable tanks that need anti-armor attacks to destroy. Or the assault cards where every tank and infantry on the board assaults the house and tries to suppress my guys. Snipers straight up killing us unless we have a med kit. And one of my favorite elements on the back of each resupply card is an order from your army command to storm a certain house near your position. And how that works is if that entire side of the house has no enemies, like here if purple has nobody, like they don't. You can send as many units as you want. You roll one die for each unit and try to equal or exceed this number with the sum. And if you do, you get these victory points, which will make the Battle of Stalingrad go better overall at the end. But then you have to roll for every unit you sent, and on a 1 to 4, they die. War is not easy. Hope you enjoyed this little taste of Pavlov's house. Go check out my review video if you want to hear more. Good gaming, and I'll see you at the next stop.